So my, my name is Miguel Marrero. I have been de developing software for like o almost 20 years. For the last year or so, I have been working with Sorcery, where we are trying to change the way that our food industry works. So disrupting an industry is hard, as, as we all know. And, but I think we are giving it a good shake. And one of the products that we have is a commerce platform that helps chefs order their food from, from their suppliers. And we are going to talk a bit today about this platform. Uh, the, today we'll talk about the evolution, not so much about how we are trying to evolve the food industry, but more about the evolution of our code, how our code how to, had to evolve in order to actually meet some of the goals that, that we have as a business. So I'll, I'll speak for about 40 minutes or so. Uh, feel free to ask some questions. We're on a small group, so feel free to ask some questions as I go. And if I don't have time to, to take them on the spot, then we might have to, to talk about those later. Um, just as a quick survey here, uh, who's using JavaScript? Just please stand up if you're using JavaScript. No, I'm not raising hands. Just please stand up if you're using JavaScript. <laughs> Pretty much everyone. OK, yeah, I was guessing that. Like, I, I had a different number on the Ruby meetup. <laughs> so, OK, no, no, come on, come on, don't sit down yet. So <laughs> raise your hand if you, if you have neat and tidy, well-tested JavaScript. Sorry, actually, no, no, I got it completely wrong. <laughs> if you don't have neat, tidy, and well-tested JavaScript, please raise your hand. Uh, yeah, good portion of you. OK. So raise one leg if every time you add a feature, it feels like the complexity of your app like, increases dramatically. Yeah? Now, now do five push-ups if. <laughs> OK, OK. Let's, let's, not, let's not do the push-ups. Just sit down. That's, that, that's how that will look. So. Push-ups are certainly hard. Uh, just as developing software is hard. Especially if, if you're like just doing these push-ups with one, one arm, one leg. Uh, developing software also becomes harder if the complexity of your application keeps growing as the size of the application grows. So there are certainly a lot of things that are outside of our control, like market changes and our, the environment changing. Uh, we, we could still manage them, but those are completely outside of our control. Something that is certainly uh, completely in our control is it's the quality and the maintainability of our code base. However, sometimes we, we, lose, we lose track of that, and we lose, we, we lose the ability to, to control that. Um, so just as... Uh, just as with, with Rails, sorry, I'm just missing there with the. Yeah, so just as with Rails uh, and, and with other frameworks in the server, uh, we, we have certain patterns and certain practices that let us reduce the complexity or, or at least keep the same level of complexity as new features are added to, to, the, uh, to, to the code base. Unfortunately, with JavaScript, it's one of the main offenders. Like, Client-side code quite often uh, doesn't have those well uh, uh, thought out designs and well uh, thought out uh, practices. And more and more nowadays, it's just be, uh, becoming easier. But that's certainly something that uh, impacted us here. So just, just a bit of context. Uh, this product, we started working on it uh, about two and a half years or so. Uh, the product kept evolving as the company grew and we hired salespeople and we acquired new customers. And we, we went pretty quickly last year from getting one of the first MVPs out there of a, of a new product to then having a first place order to then having 100 orders and 1,000 orders. And then just right, a, right a, about that time where we can see it there, but right at, the, uh, at that time where we were helping exchange that pig's head from, from the butcher to the, to the chef's hand, we started 
feeling the, the impact of the maintainability of our code. Um, so quite often when we have problems with maintainability, it's because we are not managing appropriately our, our technical depth. That's certainly what was happening in our, in our case. This is, this is a diagram that I stole from, <laughs> from Martin Fowler. Oops. Sorry about that. Something wrong with the animation there. All right. I, yeah, I adapted it a bit to reflect our, uh, what was happening with us. So he, he defined technical depth on, on, on a quadrant on different types of technical depth that we could acquire. So we have reckless and deliberate all the way to reckless and inadvertent. And in the other side, prudent and, and prudent and deliberate and prudent and inadvertent. So I think we had a combination of all those four. We will certainly not paying too much attention to how we were managing that technical depth. And that turned out into our velocity instead of looking steady, our velocity was looking more like our burn down chart. So our velocity was going down while our burn down chart was just converting into a flat line. And we started measuring the quality of our code in WTFs per minute. <laughs> so we obviously called for an intervention or a retrospective, and we all complain and bitch a bit, uh, a bit about the quality of our code and what we could do better. And that led us to start thinking about Amber or other MVC frameworks in general. We did a quick evaluation of others, and we ended up going with, with Amber. And we decided the first step would be to write a quick prototype on how our application or one portion of our application would look if we were writing it completely in Amber. So these were the main takeaways. Sorry. Uh, so one of the goals of doing this was obviously learning. Uh, we had a, another pressing feature that we couldn't actually deliver, and we had been trying for, for a couple months, or it had been sitting in the backlog. We needed to support offline. Uh, our, our certain parts of our application needed to work offline, but with the current code base, that was really hard to do. So we wanted to, to have offline support, and we wanted to learn a bit more how something like Ember could help our, uh, the maintain, maintainability of our code base. So after a couple weekends and a couple of weeks uh, working on this prototype, we identified our models, routes, and views. I'll get a bit more into that. We found that actually copy-pasting our existing HTML into, into this new prototype was like a quick way to get up to speed and migrating some of the code to, to Amber. Again, I'll go into a bit more into that. And then we knew we could get data across the wires. So we just hacked a quick API. Uh, that was on the main focus of this prototype. And then we picked a build tool, just because those build tools are always needed. And as your application grows, we certainly need to maintain, maintain things better with a build tool. So our model, um, we had We had a lot of logical parts in our application. In our backend, we were using Rails, and Rails with Active Record sort of leads you by default to have a huge domain model or one domain model. We can take, we can think of it as the model. Uh, obviously, there are ways to break that, and, and ideally, we'll have things better structured into services or into complete verticals with their own uh, APIs and their own separate domains. Think of ordering and accounting. Um, so unfortunately, we had just one model at the back end. But as we were going with these apps, and if, if you guys are thinking of writing a, a, an MVC application, or if you're already doing that, I'll, I'll heavily encourage you to, to start thinking of a client-side domain model as something separate from your server-side domain model and try to structure that more as a, a remove everything that is not needed and everything that is just specific to that one application. So we have separate applications for accounting, separate applications for ordering, and all of those have a different, a different domain. So if we think of that as the context in which different domains live, so 
in their business model or the server side model, we have multiple users. But then on the client side, we only have one user. So that, that on its own, it's already simplifying our domain. Then a server side, we have multiple orders. But then on our ordering application, we only have one active order at a time. So again, that's simplifying a bit the domain. We have buyers and vendors, but then on the, on the client side version of this model, we only have a single buyer. So again, that, that makes it simpler. So we also have different technologies. So we have active record that is coupled to the database just because that's how active record works. Uh, but then on the client side, we have multiple sources. We have local storage, we have a REST API, and we, have, we use WebSockets for some real-time communication. Then on that side, it's optimized for storage uh, because of the physical uh, way that relational databases work. And here we are optimizing it more for queries and commands. Over there is normalized. Here it is heavily denormalized on the client side. Just to put it more in concrete terms, this is a, one part of the product uh, domain. And this is how it looks in JavaScript. So you definitely don't want to work with that on the client side. You definitely want to work with something that looks more like that. So yeah, let's do a quick demo. By the way, this is, yeah, this is how the, the product domain looks client side. So we only have a handful of fields. And then for another of the applications, uh, we also have another product domain, which uses a different API and has a different structure. So in another application, then that same product model is slightly more complex because it has different requirements. All right, so. Yeah, let's have a quick look at how we did some of that. So we, for the prototype. Sorry? What's the overall customer problem you're trying to solve? All right, so we have a, an indirect customer problem that we were trying to solve. We couldn't, we couldn't keep delivering at the pace that we wanted to be delivering for our customers because our maintaining our application, meaning adding features or fixing bugs, was taking us too, lo uh, too long. Uh, amongst other reasons, because of the quality of our JavaScript code base. Uh, we also had other customer uh, requests, like supporting offline. Uh, a lot of users, uh, a lot of chefs use iPads, and they wanted to have uh, go to the invent their inventory room and their dry goods uh, closet, and then use their, their iPads in a spot where they don't have Wi-Fi. So that's something that we couldn't do unless we heavily re-architected uh, our front end. Yeah, we, so a quick way in which we started was, OK, this is, this is pretty much a chunk of HTML that we actually care about. And we identified all of that. We literally just went there and say, copy all of that, put it into one of these templates. Let's call it a script. Type text handlebars. And then throw it in there. Let's hide the JavaScript and the HTML for a second. And that was looking, well, not close at all, but the markup is there. Now, Obviously, the part missing there is the style sheet. So we could probably just grab that response there. Oops. All right. 
And here is one I prepared earlier. And we just throw a bunch of CSS there. And we had a first good version of our application. Rendered by Amber is not doing anything yet. So now at least we had a starting point where we could keep hacking, adding features, and, and, and breaking it into uh, our models, uh, identifying controllers, identifying routes. And I'll get a bit of into what all of that is in a second. So so we had that. Uh, that's already rendered in Amber. And obviously, right now, all of the template is in the same place. And so far, we don't have any controllers or any logic there. And all of the CSS could still use some, some cleanup. Um, but now, the next step we took is trying to identify different routes. And Amber uses routes every time you navigate from one place to, to the other. Uh, similarly, how, how different server side uh, uh, frameworks use routes. So as you can see there, the URL changes every time that I select a list there on the left-hand side. So we are going from kitchen house to pastry and, and breakfast, or we go to pastry slash vendor ID. So this panel there at the bottom, that's the Amber inspector. So we identified some of the, of the routes. Amber already gives us a lot of routes by default. Um, then we went ahead and identified how we were going to decompose this into multiple views. And initially, as we are progressing with the prototype, a lot was just living on the, on the main view. And then slowly, we started breaking that into, obviously, we have products there. So we had a product which has a list of we have a, a list of products with a bunch of products on, on each row. Uh, and then we have this list on the left, which became another list and its own template. And, and then we have list per vendor, which are these ones here that we're seeing on the left-hand side. So we started breaking that and decomposing those. Uh, we literally started um, uh, identifying all of those components and then broke the markup and make it uh, and made it dynamic so yeah, while I'm here, I'll, I'll show you a bit about what this part of the product does. Uh, as, I, as I mentioned earlier, the product has different areas. And one, one of the main ones is, is ordering. Uh, we have an accounting, reporting, and, and a few other. Uh, we could think of them as applications now. Uh, but then the, the ordering application that's one of the main ones that, that we have, but that's also one of the probably simplest ones. So this is a business to business application. So here, buyers already have a predefined list of vendors that they frequently buy from, and they keep buying the same products in a regular basis. So they, they buy lettuce today, and they buy the same type of lettuce in three days. And three days from now, they, they buy the same type of lettuce again and again. So they create this list, think of them as playlist in iTunes. Uh, so for the kitchen house and for MTO or for the salad bar, they have certain ingredients that they frequently buy. And then each of those is broken down by the vendors that carry those items. Uh, the application allows them to move things from one list to the other. And then they could obviously filter items there. If something is not within the list of products that they normally buy, then we show them the full catalog of products. Uh, then they could add them to their list of frequently bought products, and then obviously they could buy them. That's the whole point. They could also add them to a different list. Uh, they could optionally show more information there, and they could open the details of the products or remove them from the, from the guide. 
uh, this is a, 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 a collaborative uh, platform, so different chefs could be buying products, uh, and we, we see who is buying what and when they added that, so, so we can coordinate within the, within the team. So in a nutshell, that's uh, the first product that we migrated to, to Amber. So the, the other part was uh, a quick API. So we had the HTML, we identified our models, we identified our views and, templa and templates. So we decided to write a quick API just to send the, the data. Uh, and here, the easiest thing for us for that prototype was just to write SQL queries and then just send them the data. This is Ruby. Sorry? This is Ruby. That's, that's Ruby. Um, so that was just a quick and dirty way of like proving that we could actually do this. Uh, eventually, that API we got rid of that, and, and the other ones kept kept evolving. Can I take your Explorer active record now? Or? Um, yeah, we, we are still using Active Record, and some of those queries are are done uh, doing Active Record. Sorry, did, did I understand the question correctly? Uh, using Active Record, yeah. Yeah, and I forgot to mention, so we, we picked a, a build tool. Uh, there are different tools available. Uh, they, they will let you compile all of your handlebars, uh, all, all of your templates, and all of your uh, JavaScript. And they, so, so some of these tools are specific to, to Amber uh, in the sense that they, they know where things are and then put them in the right namespace based on, on where they are located and they follow a certain folder structure. So on this prototype, we started using Ember AppKit, which uses ES6. Uh, well, now it uses ES, it lets you write ES6 and it transpiles that to JavaScript. Uh, on after the prototype, we actually had to move to Ember Rails because that fit better with the uh, asset pipeline that we were using, and we didn't have enough time to invest into making that work with, uh, with Ember AppKit. Uh, and you're likely going to be using something else that fits in what, whatever else you are already doing for, for JavaScript. So, but it's important to just keep that in mind. So for this prototype, we identified models routes. We started by copy pasting, generate HTML, hack a quick API, and did the build tool. Now, a quick intro to Amber. Uh, I, I already mentioned a few of the concepts. Some of these might already be familiar to a lot of you. Um, but let's get a bit more into those. This is a super quick three minute intro to Amber, just for context. So in, in Amber, we have views and templates uh, that are slightly two different things. But let's just think of this view layer uh, without worrying too much now at the difference between those two. So we have views and templates that get the properties from the controllers uh, if you're using Backbone and, and Angular, then this might be a bit familiar to you already. Uh, this is different to a typical template on a server-side scenario in the sense that in, in a server-side, uh, in, in server-side, you normally render the template once, 
and then the template is just disconnected from, from the actual controller and, and the model behind. So here, the view is active and have, a, as you are interacting with it, as properties in the model or the controller change, then the view will reflect those changes. So the template gets the properties from the controller, and then the controller, in turn, just decorates the model, meaning it's wrapping uh, the properties that, is, uh, that the model has, and it also adds properties of its own, and that's the place where we could define actions as well. So if we look at that, um, yeah, let's start by, by looking at how a, a typical interaction will look. So a user will go to your site either by clicking your link on Google or uh, typing the URL directly in the browser. Then that URL will be parsed by the router. This is the Amber router. And then based on how you define your route, it will identify what routes will handle this particular request. Uh, again, different than, than most server-side uh, frameworks. Routes here are hierarchical, meaning if you go to products slash product one slash edit, it will actually render three routes for, those, for that part of the path. So you will have three active routes that will be taking control of different parts of the, of the template. So each route will have its own model, its own controller, and its own view. So each of those routes uh, will be responsible of rendering the view, loading the model, creating the controller, and then binding those three together. Um, once all of that is rendered, then we are waiting for other user interaction, like the user clicking a link uh, or clicking a button. And then that, in turn, will result in an action uh, being invoked in the controller. And then, well, the controller will, in turn, uh, let's say, call the router to navigate somewhere else, or will go to the server get more, di uh, more data and, and update the data, and that data will be then updated in the, in the view. So that's Amber in a three, four minute intro. So what, what did we do next? So we, we wrote that throwaway prototype, we learned a fair bit, and we decided to then move to a small chunk of the application. So we said we, we only had one or two weeks, and we decided to, get a, to take a really, really small chunk of the application. We decided to do something uh, that wouldn't really impact that much the, uh, the, the core of the functionality, but it will still be representative enough that we could just keep building on top of. Uh, it, it, it was tricky this part because we felt that Amber was more, uh, Amber wanted more to take to either take all of the interactivity of the page, or, or, or we were really not sure that Amber will behave well where certain parts were done in Amber and other parts were done outside of Amber with regular jQuery and the typical JavaScript code, um, especially when there is some relation between those two, like someone could drag and drop a product and drop it into something that is rendered by Amber. Um, so it turns out that uh, some of that worked really well. I'll just, yeah, I'll just quickly show a couple, a couple things. Um, all right, so this is how a list element uh, and li for a list look like. So we already had a bunch of data dash attributes and a bunch of uh, we could ignore the rest. And a, a, a few classes, and all of those classes were used by legacy code, uh, by our legacy JavaScript, in order to do things like decide what to drag and drop where, and what to do when you actually drop an element into, into that LI. So it turns out that just by keeping those classes and, and maintaining those data attributes, every, everything else, for the most part, after a few bugs and, and issues, we could actually get things to work in a hybrid model, like Amber will render markup that our legacy code will, on, will understand. Re 
We also, we also got some libraries that were working quite well. For example, we had a, an error notification library that talks to Honey Badger and uh, sends SMSs and notifies us about certain events when uh, errors happen or certain events happen client side. So that library we pretty much just reused and we hooked it into some of the Amber uh, hooks to, to handle uh, these type of errors. So it was really straightforward just to reuse existing libraries. So for this small chunk of the application, we relied a lot on, on, legacy, on the legacy markup. We were able to reuse existing libraries. And we have data synchronization and offline support. I, I skipped that part. Uh, but I'll, if I have more time, I might show you a bit of that later. So then we finally pushed that to production. And we were not sure about what to do next because uh, we had other requirements, and we, we had actual, uh, so we had other pressing needs, and doing a, a big refactoring was like harder to justify to the business. Until we, we realized uh, this item that was sitting on our backlog made it higher in the priority. So some users were complaining that the site was taking somewhere between 10 and 15 seconds. Between 10 and 15 seconds. So I, I don't know how it. Uh, I, I don't know why we didn't get to this item before, but it took us a while, and eventually that was the top of our priority. We quickly evaluated a bit more of what we should do. We broke it into areas that we needed to optimize. We realized that uh, a lot of that was because the views were taking about 2.2 seconds of the total rendering time. Uh, Rails is just awful when it comes to rendering views. Uh, so we, we were, I was expecting that querying an active record was going to be the main culprit of all of this. Uh, it turns out that rendering views was one of the, of the worst uh, parts. But this is only server side. And that's not 15 seconds. It turns out that from the time that we, well, we send the data, and the, 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 the time that uh, it took on the network, and then once we once we got everything to the client, the time it took to render that, that's what was actually contributing for the most part on on these 10 to 15 second delays. So we forgot about optimizing controllers, and then we just focus on hey, it looks like we actually need to do something client side. So we decided to rewrite everything, not rewrite everything, but rearchitect everything gradually uh, to do to do it in Amber. We knew from the prototype that rendering was way faster. We already had a solution for offline, so we knew that that time that we spent in the network, we were going to pay that cost once, and then we'll just be synchronizing data, so we wouldn't be sending a lot of data all at once, except for that first time that we were synchronizing data. And even for that, we had ways to optimize it. So due to some pressing requirements of making this thing perform better, we decided to now take a bigger chunk of the application and, and do that in Amber. So well, one of the benefits of doing this, one of the side benefits is Obviously, we, we ended up optimizing performance. I'll get a bit more into that, but let's show some code first. This was one of the controllers that was doing search. This, one, this, was, this one was one of these low ones. Um, so that code was really complex. Just to get products, filter by vendors, filter by term and category, and a few other attributes. It's, it's not that complex, but the logic here was really, really complex. Uh, and yeah, that could have been done better, but we were, 
the, there were a few variants here, uh, a lot of things that we needed to consider if we had a list, if we had a vendor, if we, had, if we were using Solar or if we were querying directly to the database. Once we wrote it into an API, this is how the controller looked. So this is the search API that ended up replacing that other controller that I just showed you. So we had all of the products already stored client side. Uh, and we, all we had to do is just search in, in Solar or search server based on the term that they were providing. And everything else was already uh, done and filtered client side based on the IDs. And all of what that API was returning was IDs of products. So we were sending really, really small payload. So that really uh, improved performance. Uh, the JSON that we were sending was really small in comparison to all of the markup that we were sending before every time that someone was search searching for something. When, when we did that, uh, and we took a bigger chunk of our application, it was still a hybrid. We, we couldn't rewrite everything just in that in those two weeks that we had to do it. Uh, so some of the functionality, functionality was still done by the legacy jQuery and or legacy JavaScript. But now we found that not only Ember needed to generate markup that was compatible with that uh, legacy code, but also our legacy code had to talk to Ember to get certain uh, pieces of data, like what is the active list, or uh, we modify something and uh, now tell Amber to go and refresh the data. So to do that, we just didn't want to, uh, we didn't want the legacy code to have access to everything that Amber will do or to all of the classes or JavaScript objects in, in our Amber application. So we created this class, that we, this object that we call legacy bridge and it exposes a few simple methods. Um, and all it does is uh, gives a access to those key features that the legacy code needs in order to interact with, with Amber. So that's a, the that's a bridge between the two worlds. Yeah. yeah. All right. And just to wrap up some quick before and after. Um, this is some of the code that we were writing before. Uh, so a lot of a lot of this code was, was forcing us to think of classes in order to find elements or thinking of uh, the markup in order to do certain actions. So instead of thinking of you need to find something that is not hidden, that it has a certain class, and then click it, uh, we were writing things that make more sense in the context of our application, like do we have a note? And then this property node is really easily uh, expressed by saying we actually have a node or the length of this array is greater than zero. And then this property can be bound to the markup to, to make it do whatever we need to do uh, or to uh, add a class to somewhere. Uh, but now that helps us think more in terms of our domain instead of thinking in markup and classes. Some other example of uh, before and after. Uh, a lot of the markup that we had had a bunch of classes that were not really just used for styling, but they were actually, or they were not used semantically or for styling. They were actually used to imply behavior, like on click, do certain thing, or data distributor is that, or the distributor ID is that value, or this is expanded. And, and all of that could actually live somewhere else, not exactly in, in your markup. So our markup is way cleaner now. Uh, now we only have the classes that we need for, for styling and for semantic purposes. Um, said that if some of you are familiar with Amber, that line of code here, I actually lied. It looks a bit more like this. <laughs> Just because Amber requires to, it adds a bunch of metamorph tags to your markup. But that's, for the most part, something that we could ignore and that is going away on, on, on other versions of, 
uh, on future version of Amber. All right, so while doing this, we, we simplified the server-side code. We wrote a communication layer that uh, helped us a bridge between lega the legacy code and Amber. Um, with the before and after, well, now we are thinking more in terms of our domain instead of thinking more in terms of Markov classes and data attributes. Uh, we removed the behavior or, or, or the state from, from our Markov, so now our Markov only represents the structure. And didn't get a chance to show, but now we have better structure in, in our applications, so it's a bit easier to know where things are. Um, sorry, it's a bit hard to read there, but uh, for this application, for example, ordering, we have configuration, controllers, and helpers, and it's easier for someone working with this application to know where things are. Uh, previously, we only had a bunch of loose JavaScript files all laying around. That's certainly something that doesn't require Amber in order to do it better, but certainly using Amber or something similar sort of forces you to do it the right way. All right, so you to, just to summarize, so we had some benefits of doing this. Obviously, we improved the performance by a lot, significantly. Uh, we changed the structure of the application, we made it more maintainable, we improved the development, uh, developers' velocity, and we improved developers' happiness, we reduced that WTFs per minute metric, and we, it's certainly possible to do this hybrid Ember legacy app integrations, and we, we, as we go, we kept rewriting other parts of our application, of our website into other Amber applications and we use some of the same learnings from, from this first exercise. So, yeah, that's it for me. Th thank you very much. Not sure if we have. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah we have. Mm -hmm. uh, can you use a require JS with that? Uh, yeah, uh, the question was if we are using required JS. Uh, no, we are not using that. We are using the Rails asset pipeline, which does its own weird thing, and it doesn't work nowhere as well or as, uh, as required. Is that what you use to maintain the client-side persistence, the same thing? For the client-side persistence? For offline support. Oh, for offline support. For offline support, the, so the main part of offline, of offline support that we did is to have some data offline and then some features, we will actually do them offline. We persist them into local storage and then once we come back up, then we synchronize some of the changes. So it wasn't, it wasn't Amber itself that gave you that thing, it was just working with local storage? Uh, yes, uh, Amber has some support for local storage, but we actually ended up rewriting a lot of, uh, writing a lot of that ourselves. But yeah, having this other structure made it easier for us. Um, yeah, that, that's a really good question. So we have a really good designer, and he's actually really, really good at both uh, CSS and writing all of the designs, but he's also really good at, with JavaScript. And he's using uh, handlebars and uh, writing some of the Ember uh, uh, templates himself. Uh, when it comes to, so, so, so we have two different workflows. For something new, he might actually just write HTML and JavaScript, and then we might just use that HTML and move it into Amber. If he's maintaining something or enhancing something we already did and he's just making it pretty uh, or making it better than what we did as developers, um, he, he will actually just go to Amber and then tweak it. It's relatively simple for him also to get started without having all of the backend. As long as we give him the models to work, to work with, we could give him some fixture data and he could just start working from those models and that data and hacking around without depending on, on all of the back end. So it actually makes it really easy for him to get up to speed. Yeah. Okay, cool. Let's thank the speaker. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah.